Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ridge Chapel. It's good to have you here worshiping with us this morning. I do have several announcements that I want to emphasize. Hopefully, those of you online have seen some of those online as you were watching Facebook this morning. First of all, we uh, heard from Cooks and Hills that they're having a special 90th birthday celebration for Mary Ellen Wilkinson, Grandma Wilkinson. It's going to be held Saturday, November 13th from 2 to 5 at the community room at Cookson Hills, which used to be the elementary building, uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with that. We've also started church board nominations. There's some materials in the back, but you're welcome to, uh, if you're online, you're welcome to just call one of the elders. Let us know uh, any particular person that you're interested in uh, putting forth to the congregation for uh, elder or deacon or deaconess. Uh, the elders are meeting tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Uh, potluck is already next week. First Sunday potluck is next Sunday, as well as the time change. Don't forget to move your clocks back. Uh, next month, November, the uh, community care project is food baskets and Christmas stockings. So uh, that'll kind of get you prepared to uh, think about what's coming up next. Before we do our opening song this morning, I want to read a scripture as a call to worship from Psalm chapter 24. Would you stand with me, please, as we read this scripture together? Well, not together. I don't have it on a slide. <laughs> you can try. <clears throat> Psalm 24, beginning with verse 7. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Mighty is the Lord. Let's sing it together. <clears throat> Mighty is our God. Mighty is our King. Mighty is our Lord. Ruler of everything. Glory to our God. Glory to our King. Glory to our Lord, ruler of everything. His name is higher, higher than any other name. His power is greater, for he has created everything. Mighty is our God, mighty is our King. Mighty is our Lord, ruler of everything. Glory to our God, glory to our King. Glory to our Lord, ruler of everything. He's ruler of everything. Amen. Let's be seated. <clears throat> As we prepare for communion this morning, I want you to be prepared and ready with your emblems ready so that you might participate during the meditation. Living for Jesus. Living for Jesus, a life that is true. Striving to please him in all that I do. Yielding allegiance that hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me. O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee. For Thou in Thine atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master my heart shall be thy throne, my life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Living for Jesus, who died in my place, bearing on Calvary my sin and disgrace. Such love constrains me to answer his call. Follow his leading and give him my all. O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, 
I give myself to thee, for thou in thine atonement didst give thyself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall be thy throne, my life I live henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. a song that was uh, I heard this week thank you to Rod but uh, if I only knew the last time was the last time and I think back that kind of struck me because uh, uh, some of the gray matter didn't come down uh, I left people hanging uh, in my relationship with them and it's kind of a hard thing to think back and think well, I could have done this, I could have done that. But you probably have some of them hang times when we don't know when the last time is going to be. But we do know one thing, there will be a last time. And the promises are there in the book. That I will come again, I will take you into my own, but where I am you will be there also. If only I knew the last time was the last time. And so we look at the familiar verses that we talk about many, many times in Matthew. And, and uh, when he had taken the cup and gave thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of them. It. This is the blood of the New Testament. Right after he had broken the bread and said, Take this. This is my body. Now, Again, I talk about the gray matter not coming down because I didn't really realize there was more in Jesus' cup than was just the fruit of the vine. Because we look a little further in scriptures where he was at Gethsemane and he said to the Lord, if you can take this cup from me, this suffering, this pain, that I'm about to go through, would you do it? But not my will, but thy will be done. And so we look at this and we, I just really hadn't really come to the depth of what was in that cup for Jesus at this particular time. So I'm asking you to think about that this week. What is in that cup that you see that Jesus displayed with love? and with promises and with boldness, with courage, that he would give that to us as we deal with people in our life this week, as we think about our gathering around this table. And so at this particular time, we know we, it's just uh, uh, this, this cup, uh, my cup runneth over. We, we, we can come up with several different things about the cup. but. I think the cup that the Lord gives us runs over all the time. We just don't realize it. We ask for more and more and more. But he supplies us with everything we need. Every walk, every talk, all these different avenues that we have to bless other people, he provides us with the nourishment to do that. And so it's in our park this week. What are we going to do with what Jesus gives us in this cup that uh, is overflowing? But just uh, again for me, the affirmation that in Jesus' cup there was a lot more than just the fruit of the vine. And as we look through scriptures, we just see on and on and on the suffering that he had to go through and just the many, many uh, facing his different things in his, in his uh, next few days in his life and how, uh, how blessed that was. So. So anyway, uh, just, uh, at this time, let's go ahead and take the loaf, and we just thank you, Lord, for uh, this uh, loaf that represents your body and that, uh, that provides for us courage, strength, and, and blessings of this week. We do it together.
and also the cup. We thank you, Lord, for your cup and for what was in that cup that you followed through with. Uh, scared, possibly unfamiliar what, what was all going to take place, but we know you're an all-knowing God, and so we thank you for that. Lord, we are thankful for this time we can gather around your table. We're thankful for the cup that, uh, that was brought forth, was uh, emptied by you, and all things was followed through that we might have eternity with you in, uh, in our times to come. We thank you now for your blessings. Give us strength, give us courage, give us boldness this week that uh, the cup that you've allowed us to have might be drain dry for the sake of others. Thank you now in the name of Jesus. We thank you. Amen. Children may be dismissed for the junior church as we sing this next song leading into the sermon. Seeking the lost. <laughs> Seeking the lost, as kindly retreating wanderers on the mountain astray, come unto me, his message repeating, words of the master speaking today. Going afar upon the mountain, bringing the wanderer back again. Into the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb for sinners slain. <clears throat> Next one. <laughs> but Jesus, souls that are weak and hearts that are strong, leading them forth in ways of salvation, showing the path of life evermore. Again the mountain, wander mm -hmm, back again, going up on, leading. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> Sorry about that. Let's do it again. Third verse, I think. Not third verse. <laughs> Let's sing that chorus again, all right? Here we go. Going afar upon the mountain, bringing the wanderer back again into the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb for sinners slain. Sorry about that. Had the music right here in front of me. Still clubbed it up. <laughs> There is another verse. <laughs> See, I said that. <laughs> On missions of mercy, following Christ from day unto day, cheering the faint and raising the fallen, pointing to Jesus, to Jesus the way, going afar upon the mountain. Bringing the wanderer back again Into the fold of my Redeemer Jesus the Lamb for sinners slain For sinners slain Thank you for your patience. <laughs> You know, Jack's communion meditation made me think of a song that I learned many, many years ago. Actually, it's Tibetan. And it goes like this. Fu be ma ni fu be ma ni wo di fu be chutsai ma ni ying ye su ju wo I used to sing a lot better than that. 
But does anybody recognize the tune? Yeah, running over, running over. My cup is full and running over. Since the Lord saved me, I'm as happy as can be. My cup is full and running over. Well, I'm okay. <laughs> it's an old song, and it's one that I really loved. And I learned it in Tibetan even before I learned it in, in English. It's always good to be prepared. Uh, before a farmer plants his crops, he carefully prepares the soil. Before a ball team takes the field, they practice the fundamentals and scout out the strengths and weaknesses of the opposing team. Before hospital aides, nurses, wheel you into the operating room for surgery, the doctor usually explains the procedure and prepares you for the operation. Well, God believes in making preparations too. He waited centuries before sending John the Baptist to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. And then when time was ripe, Jesus came into our world. And when Jesus finally began his ministry, he spent three years teaching the apostles preparing them for his service. All right, we know all that. But do you ever wonder what the Lord has been doing to prepare us for his service? How does God prepare us anyway? Now, by the way, you realize, as Rod mentioned, we're in the in the preparation for choosing uh, elders and deacons for the next couple of years. And there's a, the sheets, we'll be talking about it in Sunday school. Well, if God prepares us, then it's helpful, uh, helpful for us to know how God prepared David. Now, our childhood experiences, our hurts, the practical skills we develop, the wise teachers and advisors that we encounter along the way, lessons learned in school of hard knocks, all of these play a part in preparing us. And we see that in the life of David in the Old Testament whom the Bible calls a man after God's own heart. Now, we have a hard time realizing, understanding what that means. But what did God see in David that caused God to choose him above everyone else to be king of Israel? And what kind of things happened in David's life that prepared him to be the greatest king ever for all of Israel. Well, first of all, God gave David a faithful family background. You see, David's family had a lot to do with his preparations as he grew up. A rich heritage of faith that stretched for several years generate back for several generations. His great-grandmother, now think about this, his great-grandmother was Ruth, whose story of faith appears in the book that bears her name. Ruth faced a lot of pressures, hardship, widowhood, 
poverty. But God's hand was at work through it all. Eventually, Ruth married Boaz, a landowner, a leader in Bethlehem, and no one paid much attention as these two newlyweds settled into life together. But something big clicked in the plan of God as Boaz and Ruth passed along a heritage of faith to their son, Obed. And then Obed passed it on to his son, Jesse, who became the father of David. Generations later, Jesus was born of that heritage in Jerusalem. Now, in terms of his human generations and genealogy, Jesus, the Son of God, was descended from the lineage of Ruth and Jesse, Obed and Jesse, and David. Never underestimate the influence of a faithful family. Listen to what former First Lady Barbara Bush said at a commencement service at Wellesley College. She said, I'm going to read her words, your success as a family, our success as a society, depends not on what happens in the White House. At least that was true when she spoke. But on what happens in your house. And that is true. She was right. Our success depends not merely on what happens in our Sunday schools or our public schools, but in our homes as moms and dads and granddaughters set the example for the generations that follow them. Now, there are a number of doctors who specialize in family practice. We realize that we have in our own community. As part of their preparation, many of them receive training in what are called family practice centers. Now, it's kind of interesting. I'll just toss this in for free. Walter has a nephew, Walter Duke, has a nephew. Am I right? I have a couple. Okay, well. <laughs> who is right now interning with Dr. Pummel here in Kansas as he prepares to be a doctor. Um, in a way, that's what every home is a family practice center, a training ground, a place where we develop our skills, where we practice love, faith, patience, gentleness. But then, what if you grew up in a troubled family? Sometimes a painful past is part of what God uses to prepare us for greater things ahead. You see, by God's grace, it's possible to rise above even a difficult home life. Now, secondly, remember, what does God see? Well, he saw a faithful family in David. He saw a faithful family background. Secondly, God saw in David David, a committed heart. After the Lord rejected the stubborn and rebellious Saul as king over Israel, he sent the prophet Samuel to Jesse's home in Bethlehem. And we find that story recorded in 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter. Now in verse 1, 
Samuel, 1 Samuel 16th chapter. The Lord told Samuel, I have, told, I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But he didn't tell Samuel which one. So when Samuel arrived in Bethlehem, he invited Jesse and his sons to go with him to offer a sacrifice to God. The oldest son, Eliab, was an impressive looking man. And when Samuel saw him, he thought, according to verse 6, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But first impressions are not always right. Eliab might have been looking perfect for the job, but he was not God's pick. Instead, the Lord told Samuel in verse 7, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, I think our society needs to hear this message. Concerns about outward appearance seem to dominate our culture. Often we ask the wrong questions about people. Wrong questions? Is she pretty? Is he strong? Is that hairstyle slightly wrong? Does he wear his jacket right? Does she have an overbite? Is her voice too soft, too loud? Does he fit in with the crowd? Is he wealthy, funny, cool? Perhaps all these, and yet a fool. I mean, don't misunderstand. Outward beauty is not wrong. It just isn't enough. David himself was a nice-looking man. Verse 12 tells us that he was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. But the Lord was more interested in the condition of his heart than with the curl of his hair or the breadth of his shoulders. Remember, we've been told the Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Men saw a baby born to a family of slaves and taken away from his mother at an early age. But God saw Moses. Men saw an unlettered, unrefined, unsophisticated fisherman with little patience and a quick mouth. But the Lord saw Simon Peter. Men saw a poor widow drop a few little coins into the temple treasury. But Jesus saw the woman's faith and generosity. So back in 1 Samuel 16, one by one, Jesse's sons passed by Samuel. First Eliab, then Abinadab, then Shammah, and then four more of the younger brothers. Scripture doesn't tell us what they were thinking as they walked through that awkward audition. Did they know what was happening? Did they realize that Samuel was getting ready to point out the one that God had chosen? Did each one, if they did, did each one secretly hope to be chosen? Did their hearts beat a little faster? Did their palms perspire? As Samuel examines each one and listens for the Lord's voice of approval, 
Well, finally, Samuel announced that none of these men were chosen by God. Puzzled, Samuel himself asked, Are these all of the sons you have? And Jesse was bewildered too. He had eight sons, but only seven of them accompanied him to the sacrifice. Almost as an afterthought, it seems, Jesse told Samuel in verse 11, There is still the youngest, but he's tending the sheep. Now, why wasn't David included, invited to the sacrifice? Well, as the youngest of eight brothers, he probably seemed the least likely to be selected for anything important. Besides, someone had to watch Jesse's flocks. The sheep couldn't be left unattended, so David was the logical one to do that job while his older brothers met with the prophet Samuel. Now, thirdly, we discover that God taught David discipline through humble service. Now, tending sheep sounds dull, but it was part of the discipline of service through which God prepared David Instead of wallowing in self-pity, David learned valuable lessons through those long days and nights watching the sheep. He learned patience. Caring for sheep takes time, and so does leading people. A shepherd needs patience, so God chose a leader of men who had patience. A shepherd's rewards are not immediate. He will eat the meat from some of the sheep as the time passes. He'll turn the wool and sheepskin into warm clothes. But first, he must feed the sheep, search for strays, protect the lambs from thieves and wolves. He learned responsibility. Now, I've never tended sheep, as David did. But my father did assign me, well, assign chores to all of our, to all the children, and we were expected to do them. I can still remember some of the chores given to me And I can also remember some of the chores given to my youngest brother, particularly the chore of taking out the garbage. Now, where we lived at that time, they picked up the garbage on Tuesday mornings early at our house. And I can remember my younger brother, Paul, who's now a minister, rushing like mad to get out there when they, somebody said, the garbage truck is coming, and here he was going out there, usually without shoes on, carrying the garbage can out to catch it before it went by. Well, he learned responsibilities. And I would rather have skipped the chores, but I'm glad Father insisted because I learned some valuable lessons about work and responsibility. As Jesus said, we must learn faithfulness in small things before being given greater responsibilities. Now Luke 16, 10. And we really need to learn this verse says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Why should God let David lead his nation if he couldn't even handle a flock of sheep? 
It's important to honor God in the small tasks of life. Get up in the morning, go to work, go to class, pay the bills, be faithful in the small things. God prepares us through the ordinaries of everyday tasks. Number three, David learned how to take care of himself. His isolation in the hills of Judea as he watched the flocks was not wasted. Years later, David's survival skills and his familiarity with the hills and caves and cliffs proved useful when he hid, when he had to hide from King Saul. And later, as he led his own men into battle. Number four, David learned how to be quiet. The years he spent alone with the sheep were not wasted. They provided time for the uninterrupted prayer, communication with God. Would David have ever written the 23rd Psalm, if not for those long days and nights with the sheep. Now, some lessons can be learned only when we slow down, scale down, and quiet down. Our lives tend to be too busy, too noisy, too cluttered, to hear God's still, small voice. The world says, you got to be busy all the time. But the Lord says, be still and know that I am God. Number five, David learned humility. In God's order of things, Proverbs 18, 12, says that humility comes before honor. While his brothers auditioned before the prophet Samuel, David toiled away on some lonely hillside outside the spotlight of public view. That was all part of his testing by God. If you're a real baseball fan, well, if you're not, you know that the World Series is going on right now. I don't know. By the way, who won last night? What? Oh, they've won three. Okay, well, all right. That sees how real baseball fan I am. But if you're a real baseball fan, you'll know some of these names that I'm going to mention. Uh, You know also that some of the greatest baseball managers endured rather, well, unspectacular playing days themselves. For example, Sparky Anderson, oh, he was, well... Everybody likes Sparky Anderson except the opposing team. He won more than 2,000 games as a manager of the team. But as a player, he had a miserable 218 batting average. Now, Hall of Famer Connie Mack, who set a record in games won, won 3,700 and 76 games as a manager. But before becoming a manager, he spent several painful years behind the home plate as a little-known catcher for four different teams. By the way, did you know that Connie Mack's name, that was not really his name? His real name was Cornelius Alexander McGillicuddy. But that was too long for the scoreboard, so they just cut it down to Connie Mack. 
I mean, these men did not seek high honors for their playing, but they were watching, learning, preparing for when they would lead others. And the discipline of humble service was part of God's testing that prepared David for leadership. Now, last of all, we see that God refined David's talents and used them to accomplish his purposes. Finally, David was summoned and came in from the fields and stood before Samuel. Verse 12 tells us that the Lord said to Samuel, Rise, anoint him. He is the one. Well, a short time later, we find David entered the service of King Saul. When a musician was needed to help soothe Saul, David's ability as a harpist caught the king's attention. His musical skill made a favorable impression, brought relief to a royal atmosphere poisoned by Saul's increasingly common fits of rage. In fact, David impressed the king so much that he became one of Saul's armor bearers. And he was described as, quote, he was a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. I mean, David possessed an unusual combination of skills. He was tough and courageous warrior in a time of violent hand-to-hand -hand combat. He also was thoughtful and sensitive, a musician, a writer of songs. Do you realize that he wrote nearly one half of all of the psalms in the Bible? He was an outdoorsman who could survive alone in the wilderness, but he was also an inspiring leader of men and a good public speaker. When whatever our talents may be, the Lord wants us to develop and refine them to use for his glory. As Peter wrote in 1 Peter 4.10, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. I want to tell you a story told by another preacher who said, and I'm going to read what he wrote. My daughter ran on her high school cross-country team. One Saturday morning, I sat on top of a hill as 100 runners uh, gathered at the starting line below. It was a regional contest. It was a spectacular sight, he said. The three-mile race followed a riverbank, and the water sparkled in the morning sun. As I watched, I could sense the pressure the runners felt as a gun sounded to start the race. A few swift runners quickly moved into the lead, and I was pleased to see my daughter running near the front of the pack. At the end of the three-mile race, most of the exhausted but happy runners staggered across the finish line, falling into the arms of their coaches or their teammates who offered congratulations and comfort. But I also noticed another girl who had gotten off to a poor start. By the race's halfway point, she was far behind anyone else except 
for one other girl from a, another school and another team. I felt sorry for both of them, for each runner surely wanted to avoid being the last one coming in last. The last place runner slowly caught up with the next to last place runner. Soon they were running together side by side. And to my surprise, neither girl tried to pass the other. As the long race continued, they just kept pace with one another. And that's how they crossed the finish line. Last, but together. Well, like David, you and I face a lot of pressure. And we've discovered that we have a long, hard race to run. But even when we limp, even when we fall, even when it seems as though we're coming in last, we have someone by our side to the very end. And with all my heart, I'm absolutely convinced that the Lord will never let us down. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Is that your confidence? Is that your joy? Oh, if you have a decision you need to make today, I urge you to make it. To make the greatest decision of all, to make a decision, to make this congregation a place of service. Would you come, or if you have some other decision, would you come as we stand, as we sing? This concludes today's worship service. Thank you for listening. We hope you were encouraged by joining us on Facebook Live. Please message us if you have questions or would like more information. May God bless you and give you his peace.